All right, thanks. Thanks so much, everybody. And we appreciate uh, so many people here in person. Um, very, very important conversation a little bit ahead of uh, September 30th. And so just a good time to have a real honest conversation and um, you know, put ourselves along the road to uh, truth and reconciliation. Um, I'm very, very pleased to welcome uh, Kevin Chief and Dan Adams uh, to talk about National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. Um, before we get officially started, I'd like to invite uh, Dan up here to um, get the conversation started. He's our interim head of Indigenous Banking, and he's joined us straight from Thunder Bay today, so welcome. Um, and his work in communities and territories in Northern Ontario is impactful and a core part of the work that BMO is committed to doing with our Indigenous people. So Dan, to get us started, please welcome to the podium. Miigwech, Dal. Ani, Buju, Dan Adams, Nishinataz, Hanemki, Wikidong, Nindanuji, Miigwech, Bidnigan, Mamawe, Manajuan. In the Anishinaabe dialect of the Ojibwe language, that was a greeting, which meant, hello, greetings. My name is Dan Adams. I live in Thunder Bay. Thank you for the welcome, all together with respect. I'm not Indigenous. However, my children are. They're members of Saigon First Nation in Treaty 1. My daughter asked if I would take an Ojibwe language class with her, and I was honored to do so, and I know her grandfather would be very proud. I'm the interim head of BMO's Indigenous Banking Unit. I've been in the financial industry for 24 years, 14 with BMO. I grew up in very small towns in Northern Ontario. Our own reconciliation journeys are all very different and very personal. I'm an ally. However, as a father to Anishinaabe daughters, a relative, a friend, a trusted banking partner to Indigenous leaders, my personal reconciliation, I always feel that I need to do more. So how I do more is I speak up. I share knowledge that was shared with me. If everyone is comfortable with being the same, change doesn't happen. So if you want to change, go be uncomfortable for one minute. With an open heart and an open mind, start learning. Read a book from an Indigenous author. Take a history course. Attend a powwow and learn some traditional ceremonies. And the most impactful, be a friend and listen. The uncomfortableness will soon become love and understanding. So let's do that land acknowledgement. So instead of just doing a land acknowledgement, I thought we'd slow it down. We'll do it together and we'll learn. So again, I'm not indigenous, so I'm a great choice to do a land acknowledgement. Can you imagine asking an indigenous person to acknowledge their own land? Sometimes that land could be unceded or treaties were breached. So I'm visiting Toronto today. So let's educate ourselves. Just like Chicago or Milwaukee or Ottawa, Toronto is an indigenous word. Did you know that Toronto means where trees stand in water in Mohawk? It also means where people meet in Ojibwe. So if you're getting the sense that this area was used by several indigenous nations over the years, you're right. So let's start that acknowledgement. We're gathered here today in Toronto. We acknowledge the land that has been a traditional territory of the indigenous nations, including the Huron-Wenda, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabeg, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Okay, let's stop here for a sec. So that brought us to both the beginning of colonization. What about the last 300 years in Toronto? So let's say this. We also recognize First Nations people, the Inuit and Métis, for their rich contributions to the vibrancy of the city today. We're grateful for the opportunity to live and work on these traditional lands. So the message is, all land acknowledgements are not the same. So start your journey to learn the real history from where you're from, and on special occasions, say your acknowledgement, but say it with knowledge and thoughtfulness. There's three different keys. First one is be sincere, then educate, and then do it with a purpose of reconciliation. So where are we with BMO? So BMO's three pillars to boldly grow the grow the good 
and indigenous segments are all part of walking the right path of reconciliation. So the first one is education. As the Honorable Murray Sinclair said, education is what got us here. Education will get us out. So BMO provides all employees and the world the real history of Canada from an Indigenous perspective through Nishatamanen, our e-learning course. As well, we do education sessions just like this. BMO also provides financial literacy education for First Nation communities. The second one is employment. Increasing our Indigenous workforce internships and providing more offices and opportunities for Indigenous employees in their Indigenous communities is really important. Number three is economic empowerment. So that's led by the Indigenous Banking Unit. BMO is a leader in providing banking solutions to Indigenous governments and communities with over $8 billion across the country. So there's still more work to do. We got to be better, but we're on the right path of reconciliation. And if you don't feel it yet, keep learning. Develop personal friendships, and one day you'll also feel it in your heart. And when that happens, you'll know you're on the right path as well. Thank you, Miigwech. Can you hear us online? Perfect. All right, excellent. Well done, Dan. So glad that you're the one who did that. You did a fantastic job. Well done. Um, I'll uh, I'll make sure I introduce uh, Kevin before we get started, but just for people online, um, we are going to have Q&A at the end, but as we're going along, people can go into the chat and put in your comments, put your questions in on the chat, and then at the end, we'll also have a Q&A session, and if people want to chime in uh, online, we can do that. Uh, we can do that then, so so let's, uh, let's make sure we do that. Um, I'll introduce uh, Kevin. Uh, Kevin is Principal Chief Partnerships Manitoba. He currently works in the field of education, both Kevin and his wife. His wife's a teacher as well, and Hayden, their son, is here. He's skipping school, but um, <laughs> we're, we're, uh, we're giving him a break today. Um, but he's in the field of education, training, and employment to build relationships that strengthen communities. Kevin spent several years with the provincial government of Manitoba as a cabinet minister, becoming Minister of Children and Youth Opportunities in 2012, Minister responsible for the City of Winnipeg in 2013, and Minister of Jobs and Economy in 2014. He spent over a decade working in education and is absolutely passionate about inspiring young people to overcome adversity and achieve their full potential. So we're going to have a conversation here as we go along. Uh, Dan's going to jump in um, when when possible, but we're going to learn a lot today from uh, from Kevin. So I'll ask you, Kevin, to just do a few opening remarks on. Uh, Sure, it's uh, wonderful to be here. Thank you, Dell. And of course, uh, it was a great opening with uh, Dan. And I got to give a shout out to my son who's here. Uh, first time on a flight, and I wanted him to be able to be part of today's event. For, for Indigenous people, as we know, reconciliation is as about as personal as it gets. For many people who aren't Indigenous, much of the learning is coming from professional settings. So if there's ways we can try to close that gap, I think uh, conversations like this are are key to that. As Dell said, I'm a, I'm a husband. I have uh, three young sons. My sons are Hayden. He's got a little brother who's nine, and my youngest is seven. I'm a former politician, so I grew up with a single father since I was five, and my, uh, my dad ultimately passed away from alcoholism when I was 18. Um, and and what I'm probably most known for is the neighborhood that I was born and raised in. If you were to take a postal code, I was literally representing one of the most lowest income postal codes in an urban area in the entire nation. And so it's very humbling when you go into the legislature and represent uh, a community of people who've done so much for you. Uh, I also should let you know that I'm a, I'm a high step and square dancer. And so when I was in politics, I was known as Canada's only jigging politician. So it's, um, I did find my way, though, my time at the Business Council of Manitoba. I, be, I developed a very good friendship with uh, John McCauley, and we started to, to work together once I sort of retired from politics. And then I developed a, a wonderful relationship with Mike Bonner and joined the National Indigenous Advisory Council. So I've been doing work with BMO for a number of years now, so I'm quite quite proud of the work and I was very humbled when Dell asked me to join all of you today. I do want to say though the most common question I get continues to be on land acknowledgements, territorial acknowledgements. Should we do them? 
Why are we doing them? Um, how do we do them? So I'll tell you why I like them. The, the first reason is uh, when done with sincerity like Dan did it, it's the first sign of respect to Indigenous people. The second reason is it creates a sense of curiosity. And much of this history was purposely kept from all of us. In fact, for the first time in Canadian history, children and grandchildren have a better and more full account of Canadian history than their parents and grandparents. And that's never happened before. And the third reason why I like it is when Dan says those words on behalf of the team at BMO, what he is saying is that BMO is willing to make a long-term commitment to reconciliation or make a long-term commitment to the relationship with Indigenous people. But here's the thing. There's a much deeper teaching when it comes to a territorial acknowledgement. This is my good friend. His name is Elder Dennis Whitebird. He's a former chief, grand chief, and he's one of the first treaty commissioners. In fact, he helped coin the phrase, we are all treaty people. Now, he shared this story with me in this image you see at, a, at an elders gathering, and I asked for permission to share it. And he, he said, of course. When he was a young boy, he ran away from residential school. His dad was often in the bush for months at a time, and he had a younger brother and sister. One was a baby and toddler. So his mom was at home with his brother and sister. They were too small to go to school. And because of the abuse at residential school, he ran away. And he told his mom what was happening at the school. And she said, don't worry, my boy, you don't have to go back to that school. But when they found out that Dennis had run away from school, the priest from the school came to see Dennis's mom the next day and said, Dennis has run away from school. We expect him back in school tomorrow. And she said, he told me what you're doing to him and the other children. He's not going back to that school. And he said to her that if Dennis isn't back in school tomorrow, I'm going to get you thrown in jail. Now, that was a real thing that could happen. Because of the Indian Act, that did happen. It was something legal. The church had that kind of influence with the RCMP, and the RCMP, of course, could enact the Indian Act. And so the next day, Dennis's mom came to see Dennis and said, my boy, I think you got to go back to school. And he said, mom, I told you what's happening in that school. I don't want to go back. And he said, the anguish in her face to tell him that if he didn't go back, she might have to go to jail. These were the kinds of stories that so many survivors had carried. What I want you to know about Elder Dennis Whitebird, and I really do hope one day you get to meet him, him and all the survivors who came forward to share similar stories. He's not bitter. He's not resentful. He carries no hate in his heart. In fact, Elder Whitebird has committed his entire life to those ideals of living in treaty, those ethical agreements, those spiritual, th those legal agreements, those spiritual agreements that were purposely signed under the covenant of the creator. So why would somebody who go, went through that kind of abuse as a little boy commit himself to a spiritual covenant that was signed so many years ago. What does it mean to live in treaty together? Well, what it means to me is simply this, where a young white girl gets to be friends with a young black boy. And both of those children get to be friends with a young indigenous girl. And all three of these children have equal opportunity to be able to say that they're proud of who they are, that they're proud of where they're from. And they get to live amongst a community of people who believe that every child is born with a gift, that every child has a natural talent, and there will be a, co a collective community effort to enrich the, 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 the gifts and um, talents of all children. Think about the words that we use every day. Diversity, equality, inclusion. They were written into these treaties. What it means to live in treaty, its heart, is simply this, that no matter who you are or where you come from in this world, no matter who you are or where you come from in this province, when we gather here together today, in this place, in this time, we want you to know one thing, that you belong, that we all belong here together. And I believe that when Dan takes the time to build the relationships, and he utters those words with sincerity. He honors 
Elder Dennis Wiper. And I believe when Dell takes the time to give us a platform to have a conversation like this with the son of a residential school survivor, where his grandson gets to witness it, I believe we honor not only my dad, but every survivor who came forward to share their stories, to remind us to live up to that original ideal. Amazing, Kevin. The, um, the uh, story which um, we spoke before, and you talked about, uh, about Chief Dennis Whitebird, you, you didn't tell the detail of the story. It's, it's chilling. I mean, it really, it, 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 uh, it's chilling for me when I, when, I, when I hear that, and I hear the um, choice that uh, the mother had to make, and um, it, um, it allows us to sort of draw that parallel um, when you think about the difference between, you know, I'm sorry to use the word, but but you know, racism and prejudice. You right. know, prejudice is well, I don't like you for these reasons, but it's just sticks. You know, I can I can say what I want to say, but racism is institutionalized prejudice. It's institutionalized. It's the power of the state to enforce that uh, bias, and and it's it's chilling to hear that the mother had to make that to make that choice. And so linked with all of this is go ahead. And I do got to say mm -hmm. that. I did read your wonderful paper, yes. June 2020. Okay. And I think it's Ubuntu. Ubuntu. Oh, yes. Ubuntu. Oh, wow. Ubuntu. Thank you. Right. <laughs> the, the, the heart of that, I believe, yeah. mm -hmm. from your paper, yeah. coming off the, of course, the, the, the tragedy of George Floyd, yes. Was, yes. was one of belonging. Yes. And you actually, you actually yeah. pointed that out quite, quite eloquently. And I think yeah. that there was a, I don't think that's a coincidence. Correct. Right. Correct. No, no. Thank you. Thank you for reading that. They yeah. haven't read it. <laughs> I should read it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, linked, linked in all of this, uh, obviously, uh, Kevin, is uh, what we're doing September 30th, all around Truth and Reconciliation, um, Orange Shirt Day. Maybe talk a little bit more about uh, about how that all comes together and, and the importance of that. Well, you know what happened is I'm a so I'm a former legislator yeah. and I, I, pen, I spent a lot of time looking at provincial, but a lot of the House of Commons, particularly around children and um, on poverty issues. Mm -hmm. And I got a call from a friend who told me that call to action 80 had been passed unanimously in the House of Commons. Mm -hmm. And I, I couldn't figure out. Well, first off, he had to remind me what call to action 80 was because when the survivors had asked for that call to action, yeah. seven years had passed. Right. And he said that the survivors had asked for a national day of truth and reconciliation. And I couldn't figure out why, how did that get passed unanimously on the eve of a federal election? Because a, 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 um, a, any government is not, any opposition in government is not going to give that kind of win going into an election. So it's very hard to pass legislation on the eve of an election. That's and that's all political parties. And then how did it get passed in record time? It sat there for seven years. Like why, boom, did it get done? Then I realized, and what I thought was, most of us were sitting at home on a Friday evening at 6 p.m. We saw the news come out of Kamloops, BC. And we saw how children in this country were not treated as human beings in life. And they certainly weren't treated as human beings in death. We heard that tragic story and the story since then come across the country of the unmarked graves. And then I realized that there was a collective voice of Canadians with open hearts and open minds that said, something needs to change. This, this, this is a, an absolute tragedy, a stain on the country. And in record time, they passed that legislation. Now, here's what's interesting. Why was September 30th chosen with no debate? It was just like, boom, well, back in 2013, educators across this country heard the powerful story of Phyllis Webstad. And instead of waiting for governments to act, they just said, we will act. We will take this story and we will use the story of Phyllis Webstad to, cheat, to teach children in classrooms across the country. Now, what is Phyllis's story? Phyllis was a young girl and she was in care of her grandmother in a place called Dog Creek First Nation in BC. And when she was a young girl and they found out she was gonna be sent off to residential school, her grandma, they were very poor, but somehow her grandma found the money and they went to Robinson's store. And she said to Phyllis, 
you can pick out any outfit you want for the first day of school. And Phyllis went out, to this day has no idea how her grandmother found the money. She picked out a nice pair of pants and this beautiful orange t-shirt. And there was a lot of promise on that first day. But then she realized when she got to that school, how she got treated immediately. Now, here's the thing. As soon as she walked in the door, she remembers the immediate feeling. She felt unwelcome. Now, here's what you should know here, everyone here, and of course, listening online. If you were ever made to feel unwelcome in a place, you will never ever go back to that place. So when she tried to explain to the people at the school who her grandmother, who her grandmother was, she realized her grandma didn't matter. Then she tried to explain about her clothes. As they stripped them away, she didn't want them to throw it away. She realized her clothes didn't matter. And then the days that followed, the weeks that followed, the months that followed, the years that followed, her eyes would fill up with tears. And it was a constant reminder that her feelings didn't matter. And that's why we say every child matters. She decided to share the story because she tried to carry it. And like so many survivors, if you try to carry hurt and pain because you don't want to pass that kind of burden down to your children and grandchildren, it doesn't just stay in you, it manifests and it grows. And so, so many people to deal with that pain is they reach to things like alcohol. And that's a gateway drug to a whole bunch of hurt problems. She realized it was killing her and she needed to share it. And she believed that she was a point in her life. If she shared that story, maybe people would listen. Maybe people would believe her. And maybe they would believe her with so much depth that they would try to do something with it. Maybe she could take a simple story and build an understanding across the country. But most importantly, she wanted to share that story so that other survivors would be encouraged to share their stories so that they could start the journey of healing. And we see these images across the country now on, on September 30th of our collective communities coming together to heal. A reminder every year of how important it is to remember this history. And you don't have to walk this journey alone. And again, one of the things that I think is so important was her hope and dream and aspirations to share that story for the first time was that maybe one day she could get it on platforms like this, that maybe her story could be heard in a way that people could start building some understanding about the, not only the tragic history, but of course the impacts that we see every day um, until now. Yeah, no, it's, it's very powerful. And like you said, I mean, you learn so much from people's experiences. We wanna hear a little bit about your experience. And you know, when you talk about the Kamloops uh, situation, when you talk about um, what happened, you know, sometimes we can kind of convince ourselves and say, well, you know, they meant well, right? It's just it's an accident. You know, my, my father's born in, in the Zulu homelands in South Africa. And the apartheid government, when it came in, uh, it, the, the, the first prime minister of, uh, of the apartheid government wa was a psychologist. And, and he looked around the world and he said, you know, I really got to get these Zulu and Kosa, these First Nations, people under control. Who around the world is an example that I can use? And what was the greatest example that he could find? Who was the most intentional and the most successful at dominating their First Nation? It was Canada. Yeah. So he sent people here to learn how to properly and effectively create the apartheid system. So it wasn't by accident. Yeah. It wasn't by mistake. Um, and that those decisions, they flow through lives for generations. So so and, and Murray Sinclair has highlighted that. OK, well. yeah. OK. So, you know, maybe from your perspective, sort of the, the lived experience that you've that you've seen. You know, the, the lived experience of Indigenous people, I think, is a, a big part of uh, us trying to learn and understand about the journey of reconciliation. On the, on the eve of the last federal election, I saw this image come up 
and I was sitting at home on a Saturday. And um, as I read the story, my eyes filled with tears. And my wife asked what was wrong. And I said that my, that my uncle Dennis was on the front page of the Winnipeg Free Press. And it was a story that reminded us that in a democracy, a basic human right is to vote. But there are people who live amongst us that don't even, aren't even afforded that right. And uh, this was a story of my uncle who's homeless. And he did an interview about why it was important to vote. Because you see, if you want to vote in this country, you have to have um, a proper ID. You have to have a fixed address. You have to have people who have enough respect for you that they'll come and tell you where a polling station is. And so my uncle, of course, being homeless, can't vote. So he did the interview. But the very first line in the story says, Dennis Chief is a 60 Scoop survivor. And I thought to myself, for sure, Eva Wozni, the journalist, had to learn about this history because she wouldn't have learned that anywhere. And I believe it made her a better, a better journalist because instead of this being a story of hopelessness, it became a story of resiliency. My uncle at uh, five, six years old, him and his brother and sister were stolen and they were sold to families in the United States. And you should know when you, when I speak on the public record as an elected official, it's recorded in Hansard. So we had members of parliament that would stand up in the House of Commons and brag that we would sell children to families in the States. In fact, it's recorded on the public record, we get more money if we sold twins, indigenous twins. So of course, my uncle with no love from his family, no sense of belonging, found himself in the youth criminal justice system. Youth criminal justice system is a pipeline to prison, prison is a pipeline to social assistance, and of course, that leads to homelessness. Now that, that's what happened, and that's not who he is. I met him when I was 14 and he came back. And one thing I noticed about him, even though my grandparents never raised him, he called them mom and dad till the day they died. And if you read the story, his quotes are filled with kindness because he, he reminds people, you see all my family and friends that live with me in the street. If people don't vote and hold them accountable, they'll institutionalize all of us. Yeah. And he used that word because he knew what it meant. And he said, you know what institutionalized means? It means jail. Mm -hmm. And to this day, and even when he sees me, He'll give me a hug and tell me he loves me. Now, here's the thing. I'll share something with you. I don't like sharing this. I particularly don't like sharing it in front of my son. But if someone came to me not that long ago and said, Kevin, come here, I want to introduce you to somebody. And they took me and said, you see that man living in the street? That's your uncle. I might have been embarrassed. If I had to take my three young boys, Daxton, Kellen, and Hayden, and show them how my uncle lives, and say, that's your relative, I might have felt a sense of shame. <clears throat> that's, a, that's a hard thing to know about yourself. It's, it's harder to admit, but it's true. And I try to remind people that I went on the journey. Those survivors, they shared their stories. And in doing so, they remind us all of who we are as Canadians. And in doing so, they, they reminded me of the importance of me starting a journey. And I want to do learn a journey about my name, Chief. Where am I from? What does my name represent? Where am I from and whom am I from? And now when I see this picture and I see this image, I'm not embarrassed. I'm not ashamed. I'm proud. I'm so, so proud of him. But I know when people see him, I know the judgment that they pass. But here's the thing. When we pass judgment on people and we don't know the journey they've walked, nothing good comes from it. And so if you can find it in your heart, just to pause on that judgment and first seek to understand, I promise you two things will happen. Now, look, I'm not a politician anymore, so I keep all my promises. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, you will not believe how much you learn. You ask Eva Wozni after interviewing, 
He made her a better journalist, a more responsible journalist, a more empathetic journalist, and someone who should be listening to those kinds of truths. And number two, it'll make you a better person. It really will. I was just recently with him before coming here, and I took him out for a bite to eat. And I said, Uncle, is there anything you need? He said, well, you take me for a haircut, but I, I want it to look just like yours. <laughs> and I said, well, I, 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 could, I could make that happen. And so um, he's just a wonderful person. And uh, I hope when you see people who struggle in that way, you, you, re you remember this story. Yeah. And this journey is difficult for all of us. No, no, that's right. And I mean, you know, you, you, what, what you're saying there really resonates, right? Because you, um, I want to hear a little bit more about how you feel about the burdens that um, First Nations people have to live through because of the history. And, and that example that you gave is such a great example because there's nobody in society who is sitting down and explaining to you the math behind why certain people are in a certain situation. Right. The probability of outcome from them, which is almost near zero because of the institutional the institutional system that almost guarantees failure for, for that group of people. So, you know, how do you, you know, how, how do people deal with that burden and how do you explain it to your kids and help them to understand that, no, it's not that person's fault. These people will come here from another country and, and they'll say, I pulled myself by my bootstraps. We just, I did it all by myself. Yeah. Right. I, I, I remember one story of a, of a client that we had at an old, at an old bank and, um, he was hedging some stock that he had and he said and he was talking about how lazy Canadians were and how lazy so many people were. And he said, I came here with nothing. I came with absolutely nothing. I came from Iran and I had nothing. And um, and 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 now I and now I have ten times what I came with. And he had fifty million dollars. I said, oh, five million is playing all my money. <laughs> but it's all your perspective. Right. Right. And 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 so and so just maybe a little bit more on, on your view on on the burden that people have to carry. Well, you know. The, there is a, um, I got to bring it back to Marie Sinclair, and I, I really do, because I, I think about him. Mm -hmm. Now, he traveled the country for six years, so that's all of you being in grade six, graduating high school. Now, just think about how much you changed in that time. That's what he did, but here's the thing. He heard from over 7,000 stories, 7,000 survivor, survivors of hurt and pain and suffering. Now, here's the thing we have to remember. The reason that we're dealing with the intergener intergenerational trauma of that is because the target of those immoral acts was on children. Now, when you're five, six years old and you're like my uncle, you know, the brain science is clear. That amount of toxic stress when your brain is developing, you cannot recover. And so the impact of that is just devastating. And he said, and he said this many times that as he traveled the country, the most common value he heard in those stories was belonging. Because those children were always made to feel that everything about who they were and where they came from didn't belong. Their language, the color of their skin, they didn't even belong with their own families. So he did an interview on the day that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission wrapped up with Peter Mansbridge. And Peter Manjbridge said this to him, and this is the day they announced the 94 calls to action. Murray, there has been over 1,000 recommendations since the early 80s that if these recommendations were implemented by government, it would drastically reduce the suffering for Indigenous children and families in this country, and it would dramatically improve the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. And you know firsthand that governments, municipal, provincial, federal, and major institutions, training, corporate, they didn't implement them. So you tell me why these 94 calls to action are any different than the thousand that came before it. Now, the first thing you should know in the interview, Murray didn't disagree with the statement. He said, but one thing he said we learned is he said, and he gave three reasons. He said, the first thing, Peter, why it's different is because although the recommendations are for government and for corporations and for training institutions. That's not our, that's not the aim. The aim of the 94 calls to action are directly at Canadians. Canadians with open hearts and open minds. You see, Peter, 
is when you have truth on your side and you go directly to Canadians with that truth, not only will there be an expectation that these calls to action get implemented, there will be an absolute demand that it happens. So what is that example? Call to action 80. September 30th, survivors waited seven years and a record amount of time they implement the call to action. And every time a call to action is implemented, it improves the relationship and the lives of all Canadians. The second reason he said, and it's what Dan said in his opening remarks, education got us into this. It has to be education that gets us out. The heart of the 94 calls to action are found in education and awareness. And the third reason that he, that he said is that the survivors came forward for future generations, that he wanted to come forward. They want to come forward to share their story so we never have a country where people can't build relationships with one another. Now, a couple of years ago, we had COVID and I asked, I asked Murray if he'd come. He's a dear friend of mine. If he'd come and do Orange Shirt Day. Mm -hmm. And we had Kona Goulet mm -hmm. uh, moderate a okay. conversation between him and Daryl White. And you see, that's exactly what the hopes and aspirations were. That we weren't going to wait for governments to do these things. We'd put them on platforms. We'd have honest conversations like this. And we try to share these things in a way year after year after year. Many people believed that almost a decade ago, when the call to action came out, if they would last two years and then they would fade away. But yet, here I am on this huge platform, a major bank continuing to talk about this. It's a testament to our values. It's a testament to who we want to be and the aspirations. And again, we, we honor survivors. Now, I do want to bring these voices in, if I can, yeah, absolutely. Del, Please, yes. because one of the things that we launched as part of the bank and as part of the National Digital Advisory Council here is something called Nish to Tumwin. Because one of the things that we know is the, the fastest way to kill a culture is you kill the language first. That's why if you talk to any survivor, they will tell you they were most brutally, they were most brutally victimized when they tried to speak their language. And so one of the things that we've tried to do and the fastest dying languages in the country and North America is the indigenous languages. So look at it this way. If my, my colleagues here, a good friend of mine, his name is Ron Quaid, he's Filipino. If his parents didn't teach him how to speak Tagalog, there's a place in the world he can go to learn it. I have friends that are Portuguese and they're always saying that they got to take their kids to Portugal to learn proper Portuguese. Like, don't take any offense to that. That's just what they tell me. There's a place in the world you can go. Yeah. But where do you go if we lose Cree? If we lose Anishinaabe, if we lose Soto, or, or any of the languages that, that, that Dan highlighted, if we lose them here, they're gone forever. And that makes all of our lives less culturally rich. So what should we do? Well, we should try to, to reclaim and revitalize and promote Indigenous languages. And so one of the things I thought would be great for us to do is to bring those bring those voices to this conversation. And so for the first time, we were able to see the national anthem done in Anishinaabe by the strong warrior girl, Anishinaabe warriors. And if you ever attend a Winnipeg Jets game where I'm from, I'm from Winnipeg, my, my home community is Pine Creek First Nation. Um, if they, if all the fans stand and no one to yell True North, but all the local radio people are saying, Chief, How's a fan supposed to know when the old true north is Anishinaabe? And they said, oh, man, I have no idea. But they know. So let's see if 15,000 people figured out when to yell oh, true north when it was done in Anishinaabe. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm Bell MTS place welcome to the Strong Warrior Girls Anishinaabe singers who will perform our national anthem in Ojibwe.
So something I want to share in that is that that's Elder Gloria Campbell. She's my she's the elder from my community, and that's Elder Dennis Whitebird, who I introduced you to earlier. And they were talking to each other in Anishinaabe, and I and all those little girls are descendants of residential school survivors. And I asked them what they were saying because they were speaking Anishinaabe. And he turned to me, and they had they both had tears in their eyes, and they said. Never in our lifetime did we ever believe that we'd see children who remind us of our granddaughters singing the anthem in our traditional language. Elder Campbell went through the worst things any little girl would have to go through to speak her language. Elder Whitebird went through the worst things any little boy would have to go through. And yet they, they were watching these girls sing, getting a standing ovation from over 15,000 people. Like what a gift. What a blessing. But you know what I thought about? Thought about, think about those two elders, how they lived their life. Just think of the immoral acts and the, the trauma they went through as children. And what did they do? They continue to live a life of courage and dignity and integrity. And I thought to myself, Elder Campbell went back to that same, our same community. She taught kindergarten for 40 years. Elder Whitebird committed his entire life to reminding people of that spiritual covenant that we signed so long ago. Where did, where did they find the strength to live that kind of life? You know what I realized? It's forgiveness. They found it in forgiveness. And they lived that kind of life. And they got that moment. They got that blessing to watch those children sing. You know, and sometimes you feel it. And I was there. And I tell you, there's a there really is a spark of divinity in that. So what do you do when you feel that? When you see that kind of blessing to these two elders who lived that kind of life. Just unbelievable example. I thought, well, you share it. You embrace it and you share it with people that have open hearts and open minds and who are willing to learn this history and how to make it better. That's why the survivors had asked for September 30th to be a national day of truth and reconciliation. And that's why I think these conversations are critical for us to have year after year. So I thank you and I say Fantastic. continue, which. Fantastic. Thanks, Kevin. It's outstanding.